Greetings, everyone. I'm John Prieto, and I serve as the division chair of the Management History Division of the Academy of Management. And I would like to welcome you all to the first inclusive narratives of management history series in the Management History Division of AOM. So today's 30 minute presentation is entitled Historical Perspectives in African Management Studies, Bridging Anamnestic Scholarship and Organizational Science. The esteemed speaker is Dr. Baniel Mezbuga, who served as an Associate Professor of Management at McMaster University De Groot School of Business in Ontario, where he specializes in human resources and organizational behavior. He has experience as a visiting professor in Ghana, Germany, and South Africa, and has authored multiple publications, a couple of books as well. His paper, Academic Athena, Writing in Africa in Management and Organizational Science, earned the Best International Paper Award within the Management History Division at the 2022 Academy of Management Annual Meeting. In addition, Dr. Zuga is also the past president of the Africa Academy of Management. So we ask that you go on mute for this presentation. And we also ask that you save questions to the very end because we have 15 minutes of questions and answers. So with a thought for the you, Dr. Zuga. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I know your time is precious. And so I'm very, very grateful uh, for your attendance. Um, just to guide the discussion, um, this is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Just yeah, a brief context first. And that is followed by just a brief review of management and organization science. And then I go into uh, African management studies and specifically the role of anamnestic scholarship. By way of context, um, how I came into this research, it's about three or four years ago when I was interested in trying to find out what courses uh, are taught in African business schools that are specifically African. So as a result of the content analysis, I looked into universities and business schools, and this is just uh, a graph showing um, the growth of universities and business schools across the various uh, periods. Um, but the part that I was interested in is just this, which is the various courses. And at the time, this is three years ago, when I was looking, I did not see a single course from any business school that focused specifically on Africa. That is um, That was concerning to me, maybe because I was looking at the internet. Probably they had it, but it was in their intranet. That I don't know. But based on the content analysis via the internet, I did not see any courses that focus on Africa. So it seemed to me that Africa was like a tabula rasa. And what we know from institutional voice, basically the thinking was that um, nothing, Africa has nothing to offer. In fact, this idea of institutional void, as some people say, is that um, entrepreneurial practices in extreme institutional voids in Africa, Chinese business SOEs, their response to institutional void in Africa, overcoming institutional voids in Africa. These studies, and in fact, I would say, and it's not my word, but Soyinka's words, um, Ayukuyama's word, um, basically they think that Africa has nothing to offer. But 
Um, across the special and temporal context, Africa has never been empty with regard <clears throat> to MOS knowledge and practices. Um, indeed, uh, Ring and Bidayin in their recent book uh, in 2023, when I first saw it, I looked at chapter two and we dealt with management in early civilization. So I reached out to Bidayin and asked him, oh, um, is chapter two organized chronologically? And he said, yes, it is organized chronologically. And I said, okay, if that is the case, I don't think that is the right place for Egypt. Egypt is not third. And then what is in yellow was his response to me. Basically, he said, uh, there is a treatment of the development of monument taught in Egypt, which would be a wonderful addition to the literature. And there's no doubt in his mind uh, that a great deal of history on this topic exists, but he does not have access to it. So there is a, a place where we can make a contribution. But at the moment, given that we have this tabula rasa situation, what are the reasons for that? The seeming neglect, neglect of Africa. One is trail of Africans as having done nothing, developed nothing, or created nothing. Indeed, this is an identical comment that was given or made to Soyinka by a German, a young German, uh, when he was there visiting as part of his Nobel laureate, and that forced him to write the book of Africa, basically to show the contributions of Africa to the world. The second reason is the stereotyped racist conceptions about Africa by missionaries, learned historians, ethnographers, and even explorers. As Onye Yewu would say, and the third was a concerted effort to hide the fact that you had documented evidence of Africa's contribution in various spheres of management, philosophy, uh, science. But that cons uh, considered effort to hide the facts was because um, they wanted to promote slavery and the economic exploitation of Africa so that they can justify it as that Africans are not really human beings that possess rights like Europeans. Even in management and organization science, scholars seem to have adopted that narrative and either not looked in the crevices or they are amnestic. For African scholars, that means that they have been asked to wipe clean their past so that they can fit in the global sphere of scholarship. They've been told to ignore their ontology, their contributions and their history. Examples exist, and that is because of management and organization science. The study of management and organizational processes, structures, strategies, and behavior of organizations and their members, and which has been dominated by America and to some extent Europe, traditions that ignore other contexts, even though management and organization science is context dependent and paradigmatic. That is why Boya Sigler and Adler 1991 criticized it as being a parochial dinosaur because it reflected parochialism, which is based on ignorance of others' weight. And indeed, Aikwe Ama in 2018 asserted that an am amnestic scholarship is wrong. Fortunately, there have been changes and those changes are breath and they are upward. The changes are reflected in three terms. The first term is the historical term. There are three alternatives, alternative characterizations of it according to Mills and Co. You have the historic return to management and organization science, rethinking 
of management and organization science from a historiographic perspective and critically interrogating management organization science and its relationship to history and the past. The historical turn also has a functional and dysfunctional use. It is a functional use that I leverage in my 2021 paper. Second turn is the positive turn. That focuses on positive states and processes that arise from and result in life-giving dynamics, optimal functioning, and enhanced capabilities. It has three domains, subjective experiences, individual traits, institutions, and organizations. The third 10, ten, the third 10 is the impact 10. That deals with the relevance and utility of research and scientific quests to a particular group. It centers on what matters and has various forms, academic, practitioner, educational, and policy. Indeed, Reinecke and her and their colleagues indicate that there are seven pathways to which one can conduct impactful research. For manage, African management studies at the moment, it seems that, as I pointed out earlier on, they are amnestic. I say that because there is very sparse autochthonous theories and African context seems to be for testing autochthonous theories. So given the tense and the amnestic orientation, what scholarship is expected of academics interested in Africa? Yes. Is enjoyment by Hutunji, the African philosopher, who said um, African intellectuals have a responsibility to avoid the Amos syndrome. And that syndrome refers to the tendency to engage in exquisite scholarship that has no relevance to your original context. Amo was a Ghanaian who was taken to Germany in the 1700s when he was only three years old. He was raised by a Duke in Germany and became a professor of philosophy and wrote eloquent work in Latin, <laughs> mainly to European audience. And what he wrote had no relevance to Africa or Ghanaians. So Hotenji points out that instead of being satisfied with individual participation in the great scientific debates of the industrial world, African scholars should endeavor to create in their respective countries structures of dialogue and debate without which science is impossible. In other words, let's look to how we can use science to improve Africa. So my proposition is that those interested in Africa should engage in an amnestic scholarship. In this era of chat GPT, I ask chat GPT to tell me what an amnestic scholarship is. And basically this is what it said. That is not a commonly recognized term in academia. And that if you came across it, you should ask the one who told you about it. I think chat GBT is wrong because an amnestic scholarship or derives from an amnesis, which has been in medicine um, and in psychology and in philosophy. In medicine, it referred to an enhanced reaction of the body's immune system to an antigen that is related to an antigen previously encountered. In other words, um, recollection of illnesses. In psychology, it's recollection prior to the onset of mental and physical disorder. And in philosophy, it's a reawakening of already existing dormant and latent knowledge as indicated by Socrates and Plato. I define it as the scientific study of business and management practices based on the recovery 
and or reconstruction of Africa's scholastic and professional achievements in management and organizations. The reason is that there has been an enhanced modification of management practices in Africa due to the introduction of foreign industrial practices that are related to traditional management practices of Africa. What an amnestic scholarship does is to ask African scholars to leverage their past, to unveil the positive aspects that enable societies in Africa to flourish before colonialism, so as to transform individuals and societies today consistent with their worthiness. An amnestic scholarship asks those scholars to embrace their ontology, their contributions, and their history. It involves a combination of the history turn, the positive turn, and the impact turn. So for example, if you are using or focusing on the historical turn, you could offer historical accounts of management of enterprises in Africa before the great encounter. And the great encounter, I'm defining that to mean the encounter between Africa and Europe that contributed to the transmogrification of Africa. An example is what I did in 2023 by looking at scientific management and the pyramids, basically making the case and the argument that Frederick Taylor, who is considered the father of scientific management is more appropriately regarded as the father of modern scientific management because long ago, as far back as uh, 2500 BC, you had scientific management. And as you can see in this, Tali, the archaeologists and Egyptologists who discovered this regards this as um, the logbook of Mera as the first spreadsheet of the world, because in it, the inspector of the time, Mera, documented his work schedule, his daily activities. For instance, what he did on day 25, what he did on day 26, what he did on day 27, and so on and so forth, based on what they could piece together from the hieroglyphs. With regard to the positive 10, one could offer accounts of optimal functioning and exchanges in Africa before and after the Great Encounter. For example, the social relations model by Alan Fisk, 1985, which was based on his dissertation. From that he derived communal sharing, authority ranking, equality marching, and market pricing that has been used in psychology, social psychology, and other areas, and even in management. Um, recently, there was a paper in Academy of Management Review that was based on this model with regard to leadership. He developed this model based on a study of the Mosi of Burkina Faso, who are also in Ghana and Ivory Coast. And this was his dissertation topic, making up society four models of constructing social relations among the Mosi of Burkina Faso. And what he did was to observe how the Mosis divided kola nuts. Kola nuts is one of these nuts that they use in Africa. And long ago, there used to be a trade where South African traders engaged in kola nut trade. There was a the trade route of kola nuts. And it's from that he derived the four uh, levels, communal sharing, authority ranking, market pricing, and equality matching that I mentioned earlier on. With regard to the impact 10, one could focus on moral philosophical accounts of interactions, economic interactions, social interactions, political interactions in Africa before, during, and after the Great Encounter. For instance, the moral ideal, Matt, talks of the relations of people with nature, with each other, and with God. And it deals with truth, justice, and rightness. 
and how you should conduct your exchanges, be they economic or social or otherwise. An amnestic scholarship has essentially three main functions. One is redemptive, the other is anathnoretic, and the third is corrective. With the redemptive function, it deals with research that unveils the stature of Africa to be incorporated into a legitimate global order with minimal foreign influence. That function fits with the decolonial core. The anathnoretic function, anathnoresis in literary work refers to startling discovery that produces change from ignorance to knowledge. So research that results in expansion of the existing boundaries of apprehension to produce a change from ignorance to knowledge regarding management in Africa fulfills the anachnorectic function. The corrective function refers to research that rectifies errors about Africa. And boy, oh boy, are there errors about Africa. There are errors that are based on actions um, or that derive from actions based on wrong ideology and wrong ecology of Africa, errors that are based on wrong judgments, wrong definitions, and wrong interpretations. Say so that if you combine these two dimensions, you get four kinds of errors. To illustrate one example, the noted Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, indicated that all the inlands of inland parts of Africa seem in all ages of the world to have been in the same barbarous and uncivilized state in which we find at present. This was in 1937. It was only 20 years before Ghana became independent. He added that there are in Africa none of those great inland inlets to carry maritime commerce into the interior parts of the great continent and the great rivers of Africa are too great distant from one another to give occasion to any considerable inland navigation. Indeed, as Heimer 1970 points out, Adam Smith was wrong, quite wrong in his reasoning and his conjecture because the lack of reader transport, what he said was in fact, there existed an extensive inland network of intra-African trade long before his time, and it had integrated large parts of the continent into the world economy, including the territory that is encompassed by modern day Ghana. And these are some of the trade routes that cut across Africa. You had trade routes in gold, trade routes in salt, trade routes in copper, and various other minerals and products and services. So with that background, how then can one conduct an amnestic scholarship? What is the process? There are four main considerations. One is the historical context followed by the type of scholarship you're going to do, and then the focus of the scholarship, and lastly, the methodology. With regard to the historical context, as I indicated earlier on, you have to remember that the great encounter between Africa and Europe resulted in drastic changes. So before that encounter, there were certain African traditional practices. During that encounter, the way management practices operated was different from even after. But as a result of the encounter, African practices, practices began to peter out while those implanted by Europe or Europeans began to surge. So that is important to consider. The second consideration is the changes that occurred as a result of that encounter. And there were several changes that when organized can be grouped into changes of displacement where African management systems are removed and European ones institutionalized or overlays where European ones European systems, management systems are overlaid on traditional ones or even appendages where European ones are attached to African ones 
and lastly Grafton, where uh, the European ones are tied to African ones and both fuse to become one. Let me just give an example. The Basel system, as described by Fury and his colleagues in 1992, which is which was observed in Zambezi um, or Zimbabwe and Zambia today, um, started in the Treaty of 1629 where the Portuguese adventurers seized lands that their crown colony subsequently called the Prazos, which is their property. And that Prazo system was a, became a synthesis of two socioeconomic systems. The first was that of the Shona, which is the traditional practices that consist of the, of the ruling oligarchy and peasant producers, but it was superimposed by the Prazerios as the dominant class. What happened then is that it maintained, the Presarios maintained the sociopolitical system they found in Zambezia. The African chiefs continued to perform their traditional duties, but they no longer had absolute authority because the Presario assumed the status of overlord so that the relationship resembled that of a chief and a sub-chief. And it's similar to this figure here. Basically, that is what I'm trying to get at. So if you are doing research, you need to take cognizance of this. The third focus is what you are going to study. Sorry about the second. Um, the focus should be on the ontological demands. By that, I mean the parental requirements of being associated with any group of people. And in Africa, that means the broad spectrum of areas, financial, economic, managerial, operational, entrepreneurship, and even consumption. And what that suggests is that there are other disciplines besides management that are called to engage in an amnestic scholarship. And the last consideration is the methodology of scholarship. The techniques and approaches of significance that are rigorous um, is what an amnestic scholarship calls for. You can use inductive approaches or methods, historiography, ethnography, action research. You can use abductive approaches, exploratory, experimental, and you can use deductive approaches that involve complex designs, integrative designs, experiments. You can even reach out to Egyptology, anthropology, archeology, span as well as history and political science. They have rigorous approaches there that you can use to support an amnestic scholarship in Africa. Let me illustrate as I conclude um, with three examples for management education, management theory, and international business that I have done or tried to do. The first is management education. And in this particular article that was published in the Academy of Management, Learning and Education, I started out in the ancient period by looking at the various economies all the way to the postmodern era. And in across those economies, the management systems that prevailed in each of the economies. And then as part of that, I looked at um, various management and organization topics like trade and trade rules, state-owned enterprises, cooperative ventures, value systems, networks of industrial projects, and the principles associated with that from African perspective, as well as a large tonus of modern perspectives, and then across various disciplines, human resources, organizational behavior, entrepreneurship, strategy, and international business. And in the postmodern era, trying to make the case 
for why management education or business school should be restructured in line with the decolonial call is to try to propose a structure uh, of management education. And this is based, as you can see, on the secular structure that used to be in Kemet, ancient Egypt, and which is still practiced in modern day Tunisia, but which served as the basis of um, Fisk's work um, among the Moses, for example. And I tried to show that where formal, informal, and non formal um, education could be combined in four major circles, ranging from the core to the secondary, tertiary, and proficiency circles. In the second um, contribution, which focused on management theory, I tried to show how Africa has contributed to management and organization science uh, using general relativity theory. And during the pre-modern era, where um, um, those contributions contributed to Africa being at the top. But then what happened when we encountered Europe um, or the colonial masters, so to speak, and then after independence, what has happened or what is beginning to happen as regenerative. Um, regenerative contributions are pointed out that at Kemet's epoche, uh, you had Greek philosophers such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and others studying in ancient Egypt. And knowledge of the Egyptian mystery systems are evident in Greek philosophy. And in the paper, I tried to show when it comes to management organization science, um, analysis, record keeping, scientific management, work organization, work design, and um, all some other topics of management that exist. And for the regenerative contributions, I try to show how the contributions, uh, the focus on epistemology or ontology that combines with the identity of the contributors, whether they're African or non-African, and the reasons that account um, for these regenerative contributions. That example is in international business, cross-border trading before colonialism that I'm trying to look at. Uh, the West African traders, for example, that were um, in Mali, for instance, in the 14th century and the 16th century, Songa Empire in the 15th to 16th century, even before that, the Ghana Empire, and where they dealt with gold, cola, and other minerals. And during the colonial era, you had multinationals that played a major role in Africa, as Decker points out, and Murillo, as well as several others. You had concession companies that were assigned to go to Africa and conduct businesses on behalf of the colonial, uh, the colonialists who sent them there. Other companies like the United Africa Company or the Selection Trust companies that were all across Africa before and even after colonialism. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at those at the moment to see their contribution with regard to mineral extraction and exploitation and how that is uh, going on. And in fact, uh, creating problems in modern day Ghana. Um, so multinationals have played a major role even in the post-colonial era. Um, Udofia 1984 points out that those multinationals are imperialistic because essentially they came from colonialism. But Peterson 2021 is arguing that uh, they should share that role and adopt a developmental role uh, in the modern era. Um, and this is Decker's work where she talked a little bit about the post-colonial transition in Ghana and Nigeria. In fact, one could also look at other areas uh, where you had uh, other uh, colonial organizations. Um, she talks about the institutional processes uh, that these organizations engage in to try to stay after independence. Uh, the activities that they engage in, 
with the lobbying that they did to try to get certain institutions passed in their favor, so on. So what conclusions can we draw? Um, essentially, uh, one is the questions that we ask when we are dealing with an amnesty scholarship. The other is the kinds of research. I would suggest and advocate that we move away from amnestic scholarship to anamnestic scholarship. And in doing that, I would ask that we take into consideration the four aspects. The other thing is that there are various domains uh, that one can engage in with regard to um, an amnestic scholarship, be it education, management education, entrepreneurship, international business, management theory, HR, OB, strategy, um, and so on and so forth. We should ask the right questions, particularly with regard to the changes to the management systems and practices um, that are singular, the various types of changes that are pointed out, and whether we are dealing with syncretic changes and the dynamic effects that we are studying, we have to remember, and I believe strongly, that when it comes to Africa, the effects that we observe in Africa cannot be linear. They have to be dynamic because of the syncretic influences on Africa. And those influences have been spatial, temporal, relational, but also the ontological demands can also generate dynamic effects because they interact with one another. Such that when you are doing, looking at your equations, you have to recognize that Z, and Z here is the syncretic practices and electronic practices. If you do not account for them in your looking at the effects of African management practices on organizational effectiveness, for example, um, these compounders have to be taken into consideration. Other than that, you're going to generate effects that are spurious or specious. And I would conclude by saying that um, the scholarship in and of Africa According to me, or what I strongly believe is that it has to be an amnestic, because that is how we can show the contributions of Africa. And we have to do it in such a way that we can avoid errors. In other words, look critically at the history of Africa and see as we study management practices. Um, so look at it such that we say this is traditional before this is more than during, and this is after. And that way we can accurately account for the effects that we are trying to observe and the impact we want to create on Africa. And on that note, I say thank you very much for your interest and attention. And Leon, I hope I kept to the time of 30 minutes. <laughs> Wonderful, enlightening presentation, and thank you.